So we're here at the Supercomputing Conference here in Denver, and uh, who are you? Uh, my name is Piyush Mehrotra. I am the Division Chief of the NASA Advanced Supercomputing Division out at the Ames Research Center in Silicon Valley, so in the Bay Area. So uh, what kind of uh, supercomputing stuff does NASA do? Um, NASA is using supercomputing for all kind of uh, research, including for aeronautics research, like design of airplanes, uh, acoustics across airplanes, design of crew vehicles, uh, launch vehicles. So there's a, a fair amount of computational fluid dynamics going on there, and also uses for supercomputing for the science mission directorate, which is like Earth science. Uh, Should we walk over there, for example? Uh, if I if I look. Uh, if you look at all these, uh, are this is this, uh, this is kind of different, all the stuff that you different do? Different kind of work that does. There's also on the other side if you want to go to the other side. Yeah. So a, what are we looking at here? So this is uh, designing heat shield for, for space vehicles. Space vehicles when they come come down, they have to face a lot of heat uh, as they're yeah. coming down. So NASA is looking at different kinds of materials to be able to put in there so that the uh, vehicle will be safe as it comes down in the atmosphere. Because um, uh, there is this awesome movie, a uh, Hollywood movie, with those uh, ladies that were counting oh, yes. in, the, in the office. Hidden so, Figures. Hidden Figures. That's a great movie, right? And, yes. But now, the supercomputer is doing that, or what? So, in fact, at that point, they were called computers because they would be the ones that the scientists gave uh, their computation to, and these ladies would sit there and do the computations by hand. And now, uh, machines are doing the same thing. As opposed to ladies doing the computation, the machines are doing all the computation. They're obviously much faster and have a much higher capacity of doing that. So, uh, stuff like space missions can be much more uh, precisely calculated somehow? Uh, they can be calculated. Like I said, design of crew vehicles has to be safe, and they have to be able to uh, uh, go through air and um, land properly. On the science mission side, they're looking at astrophysics, what, how is the planets formed, how is galaxies formed, black holes, uh, planetary science. Kepler is a project that has been looking for exoplanets, um, planets uh, and on other stars which may be habitable uh, there. Um, the Earth science is looking at climate and weather modeling and all kinds of uh, uh, issues of how we uh, work on Earth and how, what do we do when we go to space. Both sides. NASA looks not only at space but what is happening inside. And that's, that's the reason to go to space, to understand Earth better, right? That's right. Yeah. If we can understand what's happening in space, what's happening, how planets perform, then we can understand how our planet perform, get our antecedents and understand. Supercomputing is something that uh, I okay. wanted to show you one yeah. poster here. Okay. Let's, let's go to that one. Yeah. So, um, so we, are, we are the primary supercomputer center at NASA Ames, and one of the things that we just did innovatively is to look at different facilities to be able to expand. So we have just put together a container uh, uh, HPC system. So this is uh, running in a container and uses Northern California weather to actually cool the system. So outside air is used to cool the system, and if um, if it becomes too hot, then there is an adaptive cooler system, a sort of a swamp cooler, which uh, has a fiber curtain and water runs through that. And that actually, instead of putting the thing in the building, we have been able to save about 99% of the water that we use for similar systems inside and outside, making it a very energy efficient way of actually expanding our HPC facilities. This is something that we've just done at NASA Ames in the Silicon Valley. Is this something that can be uh, open sourced and everybody else can oh, use? Yes, we, is that we, yeah. When NASA does stuff, is always open source? Or what? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah? we, unless it is, there's some security issues, like uh, uh, we don't want to send this out to uh, uh, some China. China or some uh, other country. Most of our stuff is open source because we let, we're doing the government, and so we're doing it with tax dollars, and it is for the public. And so if the yeah. commercial companies want to do something, they, they can take this uh, and uh, do it. So, so yeah, if I check over here, just uh, here's some uh, stuff with a... Uh, Rocket design is a big deal, right? There's yes. some new rockets coming. Yes, this is this is the space launch system, and so this is uh, work that's been done actually again in my uh, division itself, um, and they're building aerodynamic databases. So for rocket design, what they do is they run a lot of cases 
where they change the design, they change the parameters a little bit and see what regime will the rocket work in properly and what will So they have to build a whole database of the... Should we walk to the other side also? Would you like to talk about the way agency So, um, uh, super computing, what, uh, what do you think is happening uh, right now? What's going to happen in the future? Oh. It's a very, very fast ev evolving industry, It's a very right? fast evolving um, and um, you know, people are already looking, we are at the, most of the machines now are at petascale level, so we are now, they're looking at exascale. So that's the next level, 1,000 factor from petascale to exascale, and that's what the next uh, step is to get to exascale. Obviously the issue is that exascale starts becoming very large, and in particular requires a lot of energy just to run the machine. And so we have to look at energy efficient ways of doing that. So you, you're going to be part of the exascale uh, realization, like making it happen? We are, we are, we are trying to be there, right there. We're, NASA is at right behind the bleeding edge because our focus is on the product, productivity of the scientists and engineers. So we want to build a system which the users can use right now, as opposed to building something which may be useful 10 years down the road. And having said that, we are also looking at advanced computing. For example, we have a quantum computer that we quantum annealing device that we host in our system, uh, building itself, which is a collaboration between Google and NASA. Uh, this is a D-Wave machine that we host there, and uh, they uh, is used for quantum uh, algorithms to try and understand how we can do optimization problems and try and solve problems that NASA is interested in. Can we do it on a quantum computer as faster than uh, uh, a classical computer? Quantum computers are happening much later, or or is it something that's uh, is it is it possible? Can, can you kind of like describe uh, what's special about a quantum computer, or how, how soon is it going to happen? So uh, there are machines available today, but they are very small machines, you know, and mostly in a research prototype environment. There's only one commercial company, or at least uh, one commercial company that has been successful right now, D-Wave out of Canada, um, and we have a D-Wave machine that we are experimenting with. But this is sort of like computing in the 50s and 60s. It's at that level, and it'll take a few years, 10, 15 years for it to become in a production environment. Google is very interested in it. There are lots of labs like MIT, UC Santa Barbara that are working on the physics of it, and then the algorithms that can be used to actually uh, utilize the quantum computer. Right. Right, so you're predicting uh, weather events? Uh, this is solar eclipse. Solar eclipse. So, so this was this was when the solar eclipse was there, the machine, our machine was used to actually simulate what would happen. Here it is helicopter analysis or drone analysis. It's kind of like a, a, a flying car. Well, this is actually drones. Drones. Just simple drones and uh, they do analysis to figure out whether these drones will be stable or not, what kind of turbulence would they meet and things like that, what kind of design, what, how, how do the blades interact with each other. So that's the kind of uh, work that goes on here. And uh, uh, how many people are working on this, this area at NASA? How big um, team are, do you have? So the supercomputing division as such, the, uh, the facility that provides the supercomputing cycles, we have about, uh, I would say, 100, 120 people that we use. But then the scientists and engineers that use the machine are from all over the United States. Anybody who, a NASA scientist and engineer, or anybody who has a NASA grant, has a NASA collaboration, can use that machine. They, obviously, they have to be allocated the time to use it, but once they get the allocation there, so we have about 1,600 users on the machine, about six, 700 projects at any time that are running on the machine. And what are you going to be doing here during the supercomputing so, event? You have some nice big displays, and uh, there's going to be a bunch of people around here. Right. What are you going to be showing and so, talking about? All the posters that you see and the demo stands, these are people who have been doing work using supercomputers. And so there are these people are going to be, in particular, some of them have been chosen to present their work here in a half an hour talk using the big display. It's called the hyperball that we have out there. Um, and that's uh, uh, just present the work to the various uh, the audience so that they can expose them to what NASA does and how NASA is successful at working. All right. Thanks. So thanks a lot. We hope you have enjoyed this video, and for more videos, go to freakphysics.com.